the world's viewpoint of the apocalypse being the end of the world, that the book of Revelation is to show us the beast. Triple six. Scary horsemen. The beast, his mark, the fear, the zombies. But this isn't the full story. The full story is this. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the victorious one. The one who was crucified, but rules and reigns forever. The one who is coming to fetch us. The apocalypse is the revelation of Christ, the lamb that was slain, but who is now and forevermore will be the roaring lion of Judah. This is the revelation. Good morning. Uh, we're preaching through the book of Revelation, so if you're just joining us for the first time this morning or you're joining us online for the first time, go back. There are another 18 installments that you've missed, and we're busy working through the book systematically. So we, we're pretty much a third through the book already, but we're only on finishing up chapter 3 now, even though there are 22 chapters. What we've been working through is seven letters written to the seven churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And it's the way Jesus has been addressing the church, saying, there are a couple of things I need you to have a look at. And every one of them is loaded with emotion, it's loaded with a challenge. Most of them loaded with, uh, hey, well done. You've done this well, but I have this against you, so do this. This morning's is a bit different. But everyone has allowed me to see this really, and I, honestly, I'm so happy I'm done with the churches. I'm done. With, it's the seventh one. To, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the churches now. I really am. Because every time I look at it, I've got to do kind of introspection and go, where are we as a church when it comes to this letter? Are we doing these things, aren't we? And, and you can never say, well, we're doing well, because that's pride. And if you're not doing something well, then you've got to correct it. So it's always this balancing thing. And you are the church, so I'm assuming you, I'm hoping you're feeling the same way. Can I ask you to do this favor for me? It's just a little bit of, I want you to understand something this morning. Um, can I ask you to close your eyes? No one's going to trick you into doing anything. Just relax. If you can tilt your head back just a little bit. Open your mouth ever so slightly. Just nothing's, no one's going to put anything in there. Well, well, with your eyes closed. Now imagine it's a warm day. And someone comes with a slightly rotten egg. It's been cracked open. Come tilt your head back. It's a big egg. And, and they drop this fertilized, semi-rotten egg into your mouth. And you can feel, right now, in this moment, you can feel the slime running down the sides of your throat. As Can you feel that? Your instinct is to go what? That's how Jesus feels about this church. I'm a pictures guy. So for me to understand what's happening, I'm thinking, this is the way Jesus responds to this church. This is how they make him feel. Let's make sure this one is not us. Let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll never have a response to our church. Lord, I pray that your response to us will be, well done, my good and faithful servant. I love you, my children. Come into the great reward that I have for you. May we never cause a gag reflex, my King. So Lord, I pray, lead us and guide us this morning where we need to be challenged. Shake us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 3, verse 14. Hold on. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I need to quickly settle this. Jesus is not the beginning of God's creation. He is the beginning where all creation came from. God did not make Jesus. Jesus always was. He was not an afterthought created later. Okay, that is a false religion headed for hell. The true gospel is what we sang this morning. I believe in God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. Equal in submission as well out of love. 
Do we fully understand it? No, I don't fully understand God because I'm the created. I do not have to understand the creator to understand my place in life. But the reality is this is not a text saying he's the beginning. This is where God started creating things. But Jesus is the author. He's the origin of all creation. You with me? Just because my name's on the front of the book doesn't mean I was the first thing that had to be made before the book. No, there were people that were before me. No, no, it's not that. Jesus is the creator. Go read Colossians 1. I want to give you a bit of a background to lay this here. There's so much that happened in the life of this city that Jesus references that I'm scared we're going to miss some of the key things if we don't know what the city was about. Uh, it, so I'm going to go through a whole lot of stuff. It is phenomenally interesting, and I'm going to try my best to present it that you go, I didn't know that, and now that I know it, my life is better. All right. No, no, I don't want amen this morning. I want you to sit here, and I want you to be very lukewarm. So that you challenged. Okay, so Laodicea, the guy named it, the city, the founder of the city named it after his wife, uh, Laodice. It's a dreadful name. Never name your children this. But what's interesting at the same time is Laodicea means the people of, like the Nicolaitans, it's the people from Nicholas. But the Laodicea means for the people, Decea means ruled or rulers. The name even references, not the origin of the name, but the name even references that it's ruled by the people. And that's the root cause that we find in this church that is ruled by the people. There's only one that rules the church, and that's the head, Jesus Christ. It's what he says in his word. That's what we base our lives on, and he's the ruler of the church. Amen. No, no, no. Be lukewarm. Just relax. I don't need you to have passion or excitement. Christians are not called to be passionate or excited. Christians are called to be lukewarm. Just, just be there. So I'm going to work through. So I don't know if you know this, but Johannesburg is the biggest city in the world. Um, biggest city in the world that's been built not near a water source. Makes it tricky. Uh, puts a whole lot of pressure on rand water and a whole lot of stuff. But most big cities, all other big cities, are built on a water source. It could be on a lake, on a dam, on a river, or at the ocean. Joburg was built there because there's a gold rush over there. So they built a city there because they couldn't choose where the gold was going to be. So that's where the city is. That's exactly the same with Laodicea. here. So it made the city phenomenally wealthy. So it's built away from any water, which is really important. But the city is a trade route. So all the trade that goes through there allows the city to become, it is the wealthiest city in this, in, in this area of all the different se seven cities that get addressed. It's, it's got the kind of wealth that people would go to the city just for the money. It's the only reason why people go to Joburg. It's either to lead a church or to go and make money. You don't go there for the scenery. You don't go there for the traffic. You don't go... There's only one reason you can go there, is to make money. And as Christians, there's only one other reason that will be for Jesus. But what's interesting as well is they had this huge health industry. They had a medical school, not quite VITS. Fees were much lower and it was easier to get in. But they, had, they were big into health. For them, living healthy. So the city themselves, they had a whole lot of spas. Not there's a friendly spa wherever you are. There's a heated spring wherever you are. That's the kind of spas they would have. They were gymnasiums. That was their big thing. When we, we spoke about the previous church, they were big into entertainment and stuff like that. They were big into health. They had a very weird industry as well. They had a black sheep industry. They had a full-on black sheep. So if anyone has ever said to you, the black sheep of the family, this is where you would have been from. And what made it so unique is that the, the, the wool was the softest wool you could get. So it was the highest quality. So they had the most phenomenal clothing. You're going, what's this got to do with the church? You're going to, I'm going to get to it now. So you've got this place that's got this phenomenal black wool. They have the best black clothing. They weren't dyeing it well black yet. So you had this beautiful black fabric. They had a, a special ointment, a self that they used to have that would help people cure blindness. I'm not talking your eyes missing. Only Jesus does that. 
with a bit of spit and mud, but they had a special ointment that was being produced naturally there that they'd put on the eye and it would kill eye infections and bacteria. And people that were starting to lose their eyesight or cataracts were starting to eat away at their eyes, they could put this on and their eyesight would be restored. This is a phenomenal city. This is a city of incredible wealth, health. They've got everything going for it. One of the things, and I spoke, I've spoken about it in most of the cities, when there was a great earthquake, they'd lost everything. And the governor then said, for two years, you don't have to pay tax. And uh, they sent money to see the cities rebuild. Laodicea said, we don't need you. We have enough of our own money. We'll pay tax and we'll rebuild the city by ourselves because we don't need you. They kind of showed the, they flipped the bird to the emperor and they showed off the incredible wealth because they could get it done themselves. But like I said, this is a city far from any water source. And water's life, we know that. So they built these two aqueducts. Now, the main aqueduct would bring this beautiful cold water, but from 10 kilometers away, from a town called Colossi. That's the Colossians. So the snow-capped mountains, the water would melt. It would be this beautiful spring water. You'd be buying it in the shop, bottled at source. It was amazing. And the water would then flow, but it's flowing in the Middle East, where it's always 40. And by the time it would get to the city, it would be lukewarm. Then at the same time, they had this natural hot water spring. But it was just outside the city. It kind of fed the water to the spas, and it has phenomenal minerals and salts. That was so good for your body when you'd sit in there. Think butt plus without the crowds and the caravans and the tents. It's just beautiful. Or warm boils, bella bella. So they have these two water sources. But by the time the water gets to the city, it's lukewarm. They, they, they've got a problem. And there's so much calcification in the pipes, and it was an issue. But they, they made it work. The problem is when water's got a lot of salts in, it's called emetic. It actually makes you sick. When you sit in it, it's lacquer. Like you can get into a, a river that's from a natural warm spring, you get in, it is so good to sit in there. And if you really want to flush your insides, take a few big mouthfuls. Give it 12 hours. The last thing I want to mention about the city is that even the temple had such phenomenal wealth. You put it in perspective. They had to pay temple tax. Not tithes, not offerings, not alms. Temple tax. The temple tax would equate to 9 kgs, or just, just under 10 kgs of gold a year. The temple would move so much gold every year that the emperor banned gold being exported out of Laodicea because the Jews were affecting the economy by the amount of gold that they were moving just from the temple tax. So it, it sounds ideal. And then naturally it looks perfect. You've got a great healthcare system, you've got financial resources, you've got spas, you've got ophthalmologists, you've got this phenomenal place that's managing water better, trade route. You'd have to be skilled at being stupid to not make money and flourish in Laodicea. So Jesus addresses the church. Revelation 3, verse 15. I know your works. You're neither hot, you're neither cold nor hot. I would rather that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Be a lukewarm Christian. What is his response? Some translations say, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Spitting means to clear your mouth. Vomit means to clear your mouth and whatever was in your gullet. So this is where I've heard so many stupid teachings from this point. Because they'll say, teachers will say, well, Jesus would rather have you on fire for him or totally cold towards him than have you lukewarm. That's a lie. That is stupid. Let me read this to you, 2 Peter 3. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. He's not saying I want you hot or, or cold, and cold means you're unsaved. That would be ridiculous. He's speaking to the church. He says, I either want you hot or I want you cold. But because you are lukewarm, he's referencing in the natural, these aqueducts, where the water would flow and places it would meet. And you'd have this insipid, who drinks cold coffee? Not iced coffee. Iced coffee is phenomenal. 
But when you've, you, you, they've made you a nice cup of coffee. I drink coffee. My family knows it has to be. Throw to burn. When you drink it, it must burn inside like chili. It's not just, it must be hot. If I drink something cold, it must be mostly ice. I don't want this puke warm stuff. Pick one, either one, don't let them become one. It's biblical. I watch people pick up a cup of coffee. It's a day old. Ach, it's fine. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. That is ungodly. Your values do not line up with the word of God. You know, there's that scab. You take a sip, then it hangs. And then you look and there's a fly. You go, at least it's baptized. Oh, there we go. I knew I'd get a response eventually. Let me tell you what a cold Christian looks like. Picture this. You dive into a river in Norway with a pointed stick, hunting salmon. When, when you get out and you've got the salmon stuck on the end of the stick, you ride your grizzly bear back to your cabin because you're so on fire and you're so excited because it's so fresh and it's so amazing. You must come to my church. It's just phenomenal. You must come to Lighthouse Church. It's the best place to go. You're the one that invites everyone to church, even if they've got a copy on you or a duck on you. You've got to come to Lighthouse Church. It's amazing. You've got to get there. They're going to shout at you. There's a bald guy. He's going to get so frustrated with you. It's going to be amazing. The worship is just so loud. You've got to get into my life group. You've got to go. The coffee. And that's just the guy doing the intro. You should be, I often tell people, Lighthouse Church is like a cold pool on a hot day. You tell your friends, come, come, you'll enjoy it. They get you. And if you're a visitor here this morning, you understand. You get you and you walk in, it's like, oh my gosh, it literally is the whole old game building. And it carries on into infinity where there are children. And you walk in, it's like, it's black walls. Why would a church have black walls? Then they start the music and there's a countdown and it's loud. And it's like, oh, then this happens and then there's videos. It's like, Phew. the thing is this, you know when it's on a hot day and you're in the pool already and you say to your buddies, jump in. And they go, is it cold? You go, no. No, it's lacquer. It's just, it's nice, but you're blue. Blue is the blue, new color. If you've seen your kids swimming, they jump out, they're like little smurfs. Are you happy? Because they've been encountering this refreshing, exhilarating water. Then you come to, you know, then you jump in the water because it's a hot day. And you jump in the water and you think, you lying. Dude. You lied to me. It's not, no, no. That's always said to people. You come to Lighthouse Church, come three times before you make an assessment. Because it's like jumping in the water. It's like, I'm getting out. Then you stay in a minute or two, and after five minutes, after ten minutes, you're saying to your other buddies, no, no, come, it's lacquer. I'm talking about those people that are hyper about the gospel. I'm talking about those people that they can't shut up about Jesus. I'm talking... And as I've spoken about these people, you have a mental image of some of them, eh? You think, I know them. They normally sit, yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you what a nice hot Christian looks like. I'm not talking about on fire. They should both be on fire under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But you know you get those Christians? They are just, as much as the other one is fishing for salmon with a sharp stick riding a grizzly bear, they are like warm soup on a cold winter's day. When you spend time with them, in their presence, it's like you've been hugged. They're just so warm and so comforting and they're so kind and they just, they, they just kind of draw you into the presence of God because they just love you so much and they love Jesus so much and it just oozes out of them. And they have this wonderful demeanor that when they speak to you, you're like, when they say, do you want a bra? You go, yes, I'll be baptized. <laughs> do you want to come to my life group? I'll give my heart to the Lord. It's like, that's not what I said. Amen. Jesus isn't dead. Yes. They have that personality. It's the warm, soothing, healing people. You know who I'm talking about. They're sitting here. And Jesus is saying, I don't mind if you're the energetic, doing flick flags, cartwheels, waving flags, and that's just while you're at home worshiping to Yakaranda. That's cool. 
And I, I'm, I'm great with the fact that you're this, you're this calm and, and, you know, you're this gentle, loving person who just wants to, you just like that warm bowl of soup on a cold day. You just, and fresh white bread. You just that hug. He says, I, I, it's cool. I want you, don't you try to be them and don't them try to be them. But if you're this lukewarm, barely rotten, septic, flippant thing hanging around doing nothing, I will spit you out so you can go reassess who you are. Oh, it got chilly in here. Moving on, but not making it any easier. However, what makes that energetic, energizer bunny, hunting, fishing salmon, riding the grizzly bear, what makes them like that? What makes the... Mm, what makes them them is what makes the hot water hot and the cold water cold is that the closer you get to the source, the closer you get to the source of the underground water where it's hot, the hotter it will be. The closer you get to the source of the mountain top where the snow was melting in the first place to give you the cold water, the closer you get to the source, the more dynamic the person will be. The more you spend time at the source, the more things happen. The more you spend time with Jesus, the more you're going to be the person that he's called you to be. You do not grow into what Christ has for you by not walking with Jesus. You only change. You only encounter this. You only grow into this when you spend time with him. You can't grow anywhere else. Else you become a... Ugh. Revelation 3.18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. But hang on, they are rich. And white garments. No, no, but we've got black sheep wool. White garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And self to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. No, but we've got the ointment, Jesus. Now he's saying, whatever you've got in the natural means absolutely nothing to me. You think you're so cool. They had the most money, they had the best clothing, they had the best ointments, they had the best everything. Jesus says, you know what you got? Nothing. No, but Jesus, we saw, no, you got nothing. <laughs> Let me tell you, and I, I felt this on Thursday night at prayer meeting, and I spoke to uh, Leon, who's at prayer meeting, one of our other pastors, he's not here this morning. And there are a whole lot of you sitting beyond the pillars over there. I can't see you while I'm preaching. These lights strip me of any vision beyond my wife. And there are a whole lot of people sitting just there and over here. Yes, yeah, as well. Oh my gosh, they're there. And you're just one in amongst hundreds of people. But there's a whole lot of you. You are so significant, you don't even know what you're doing. You don't even realize what you're doing in the kingdom. You're working as a nurse and you're praying for people. You're in business and you're encouraging people. You're doing stuff because there's already a, there's something of a, a heat in you. There's something about this cold, fresh water in you. And Jesus is saying, just get a bit closer to the source so I can ignite whatever's in you that I've placed in you so you can start functioning and being. You think, you, you think Jesus cares? He loves, he wants to look after you. Uh, natural resources are essential. He wants to see you provided for physically and, and spiritually and emotionally. And, and he wants to see you, he wants to see you fed and in a home. And he wants that stuff for you. But the way you see yourself and the way the world sees you is not the way Jesus sees you. These guys had the money, they had the resources, they had all the fancy ointments, they had the doctors. Love doctors, love medicine. I had a crazy spasm in my neck. I went to a physiotherapist. God bless them. I hate them. I battled so much. They stuck a needle this big into my neck. And they said, this will help. The needle did this. I thought it was a pain gauge. Because I lay there. I have this thing when I'm in a lot of pain, I laugh. So now some people laugh when they're nervous. I'm lying there and I'm laughing. She says to me, is it painful? I'm going, I'm dying. <laughs> and I love them. Amazing stuff. I'm, 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 it's fantastic. But my first port of call is, Jesus, what are you calling out of me? First he said, don't be stupid. Don't do what you did before. And it sounded a lot like my wife's voice. And I know it's the Holy Spirit. But a whole lot of you, you're busy looking at your own situation and going, I don't have the finances. Jesus says, don't worry about that. I've got something else for you. you go, well, I, 
I can't do what I'm called to do because I'm not that guy. That word about the clay pots, that's my preach. You think you're cracked and you're insignificant. He made you. Oh, but I've messed up so badly. I've sinned so badly. I need to read this so immediately and jump a little bit down. Romans 8, for I'm sure that neither life, sorry, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. So Paul says, anything will be able to separate us from the love of God. Hang on, we quote that scripture wrong. It's not finished. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing separates us from his love if we're in him. The thing is, we want to do our own thing, but we need to be ignited, hot or cold, whatever your natural tendency is, but you need to be found at the source. You need to be in his presence. You need to go and spend time with him. You need to, you need to have him tell you who you are. And he'll tell you stuff. He'll tell you stuff that you don't want to hear, and then he'll tell you stuff that you do want to hear. And he'll comfort you and he'll guide you, but I never want to be spat out. I never want to be spat out. I want to spit at the devil. But I never want to be spat out. I never want to get to a point where my life is so bland that I'm neither hot nor cold. So he goes, actually, I'd rather not have you. Never. This is the challenge, though. It literally speaks of your enthusiasm. Revelation 3.19 those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Remember, discipline isn't punishment out of hatred. It's correction out of love. So be zealous and repent. Zealous is to have zeal. Zeal is to have overexcited, exuberant passion. That's what it means. He says, repent. Repent doesn't mean, oh, Jesus, I'm a fraud dung. No, no, no. Now he's saying repent means literally change the way you think. And the scripture also says what you think you are. So change who you are, but change in the way you think. Change the way you think. Change the way you see yourself. And have passion. Have passion. We need to be Christians with passion. We need to have be Christians. Well, this is just how I am. Change. I have seen the driest people. I'm talking those people that can't even stand close to the bra. They'll, they'll burst into flames. They're so dry. They have nothing. You knock Jagermeister's in. Or old school, stro rum. All of a sudden, there's a personality. It's like, where did you come from? They can dance. They can have life. They can talk. They've got a whole lot of enthusiasm. You can't get them to shut up. The Holy Spirit wants to do that to you. I'm not saying, hey, no, no, we're not going to have communion with stro rum and vitblitz and that. Uh, I'm saying we need to start trusting Jesus for a supernatural passion. Because the world doesn't need any more druer. Bola. He's calling us to have zeal. Change the way you think. Stop doing that. But we all want to be EO Christians. <sighs> I was going to get the worship team up and we're going to try worship again, but we'll do it next week. We need to start trusting God for some passion in our lives. Guys, you need some passion for your families. Get excited. And not just doing your hair, give your wife that look. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where you're excited about your children walking with Jesus and you spend time with them and you talk to them about Jesus and you go through some stuff and you spend time and you love Jesus and get a bit of excitement. And even if it's the excitement where you're warm and loving, when last did we really love the hell out of someone? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's trying his best to come in. He's not holding back. When somebody knocks on the door, it means they want to come in. Right? It's not a knock-knock joke. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him 
and eat with him and he with me. We're going to eat that meal today. Have you said yes to Jesus? Have you said yes to this? He's standing at the door and he's knocking. And if anyone will hear his voice, and it's the Father's voice calling you to repentance, change the way you think, say yes to who Jesus is and who he is to you. Acknowledge him as Christ, Lord, Savior, the one who died for you, the one the whole world revolves around. He's knocking, saying, if you'll hear my voice, what's this voice? Word of God speaking to us. Me reading the word to you this morning. If you hear my voice, what happens when we hear his voice? He comes in to eat with us and us with him. He starts telling you who you are. You're thinking, but I'm the lowest of low. I'm just a minimal wage earner. He goes, you have no idea what I've placed in you. No, but I'm a pensioner. You have no idea what I've called you to. There's a couple I could use as an example. There are a few of you I could use as examples. But I have examples in this church, and I don't want to expose them. But it's like once they retired, they got refired. And it's like, no. No, no, no. Now the best is yet to come. You think you're heading towards the edge. You're thinking, Lord, I'm almost at the end of my innings. God's saying, it's only just starting. Well, I don't know enough. No, you know nothing compared to what I have in store for you. But if you let me come in, and some of you are born again Christians, but you're not having fellowship with Jesus, and he's not telling you who you are. You're getting your identity from Facebook and other social media platforms and the news, and somebody that's lying to you about who you are. Great for entertainment, not for finding your identity. You need to go find yourself in the Word of God. Go and open the Bible and go, God, who do you say that I am? I need you to tell me. Because he'll start saying, I'm calling you to more. Jesus says, go and buy things with refined gold. How do we refine gold in the kingdom? It's called faith. It's in the, it's in the life group notes. I'm pushing out of my time horribly now. You can, you can look in your life group notes. If you're not in a life group, get into one. You can go look at how do you get gold, kingdom gold. It's faith. But I'm telling you, friends, we will miss what he has for us if we don't know who we are in him. And he's standing at the door. Your door. If you don't know who Jesus is, if you've never given your life to him, you have to give your life to him. You have to surrender to him. But perhaps you're a born-again Christian and you have moved so far away from him You've become lukewarm. There's no passion. There's no zeal. You need to get back to the source. You don't need to be the hyper-energizer bunny. You don't have to be the loud one. At the same time, if you are, if you're an intense person. My wife has this phrase that she sometimes uses on me. She says, you're a bicky buyer. The other day I agreed with her. I said, I know I am. She goes, do you really know how intense you are? I said, I do. I sometimes think, gee, gee, just chill a little bit. But I can't. Don't be that if that's not you. If you're the stoic, if you're the quiet, if you're the intense, as long as you're loving and you're passionate about Jesus, please be that. You're the wise owl or the bouncing tigger. Just please don't be Eeyore. Because then you're just as good as poo. He's knocking on your door. The one who conquers, this is verse 21, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. I cannot wait for that day. It's like, no, no, but he's on the throne. We'll fall down and worship. We'll get to that. I'll tell you in chapter 4. We'll get to that. But it's the one who conquers. I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne. I remember when Caitlin and Leo were small. And uh, they'd walk into a room, and if it's a crowded room, there are a whole lot of people, and I'm sitting there. They'd scan the room, and they'd look for me. And all I'd do is go like this. They'd walk past everyone, they'd come and sit next to me, and then they've won. Just get to dad, because when I'm with dad, it's cool. I don't care what any of you think, I don't care any of what you do, dad's got it. And he's like, no, no, friends, not enemies. Like, it doesn't matter, dad, I don't care. From a small age, they knew, as long as I could go and sit next to dad, doesn't, at a bri, at a meeting, go and sit next to dad, just go and sit next to him. That's our reward, is we go and sit next, he comes, he says, come. You've won this, man. Come, you're done. It's the end of your life. It's finished. We're going to wrap this all up very soon. The entrance into eternity has just begun. Come sit. We're going to sit on the throne. I have no idea how big it is. I'm sitting in front. I'm letting you all know. I'm going to sit there until I'm comfortable. But the thing is, we're not living with eternity in mind. We're living with month to month in mind. If I can just pay this bill, because it's, it's a bit of a distraction that the enemy has set up. If I can just beat this, if I can just beat that. But let me tell you this. If you're willing to put your faith in Christ Jesus... 
love doctors. I really do. Some of my favorite people are doctors. But I put my faith in Jesus that he'll heal. I love using financial resources, whether it's for life, extending the kingdom. You need a salary. But Jesus says, don't ever think that's money. Real riches is found in me. Your health, your finances, your life, it's all in Jesus. And this is the great thing. He doesn't say, boys, come and knock on my door, and when I'm ready for you, I'll open. He says, guys, I'm standing at your life, your door. I'm knocking. When you're ready, let me in. And I do believe if you've never given your life to Jesus, you've got to let him in. You've got to let him in. But some of you, you're so far from the source you're so far from spending time with him. You're so far from hanging out with him. You've become a little lukewarm. And it's none, none of us will ever have that desire to be lukewarm. Our desire has to be a warm bowl of soup or salmon hunter with a stick. It doesn't matter as long as we're in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness. Your incredible love for us, your passion. You know, Lord, I talk about passion. I don't know what passion it takes to take Jesus to the cross. I don't know what passion you have to have inside of you to be whipped and beaten and have a crown of thorn pressed in your heads, nailed to a piece of wood, humiliated in front of everyone, mocked, ridiculed, and having to forsake everything that heaven has to offer. I don't know what passion that takes, Jesus, but we know you've got it, and that's who you are. Lord, this morning, I, I ask that whoever has drifted away from you and they starting to, they know they're lukewarm. Lord, I pray, ignite them. Draw them in. Draw them closer. Draw them closer. Lord, I pray for whatever gifting the guys have, the girls have, whatever gifting our friends have, that they will be, they'll embrace what you have for them and run until it's their time to go home. I'm speaking to a lot of young people now. You think you have a lot of time. You don't. You have tomorrow, and it's not even guaranteed. Run to run and finish this race well. To all the older folk, what if God extends your life by many years, and he's giving you more years because there's more for you to do? Start walking in the health. Start walking in the victory. Start walking with the understanding that he has not taken you home yet, that he's got more for you to do. And so many of you older folk, you are the warm bowl of soup on the cold winter's day that just loves others so well. You're like grandparents, the, the old warm grandparents. We need you so dearly for your hyper-energizer ones. May God give you the strength and energy to run and run and run for Jesus and never get weary and never get tired. I pray that lukewarmness will shift this morning, that we will move to the source. Friends, while eyes are closed and heads are bowed, there are two things I want to say. One's an invitation. The one thing I want to say to you, please live a life that your children will, will pursue Jesus in the way you live, whether it's the passionate about Jesus in a crazy way, or the passion about Jesus in the warm way. Let your children never become lukewarm because their parents were lukewarm, please. But if you're sitting here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, my friend, at the end of time, you will be spat out. There are no more options. There are no more chances then. And I'm not trying to scare you into heaven. I'm inviting you into the reality that Jesus loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And he showed that love on the cross many years ago. And he died and he rose again for you. To pay for your sins, you know you're a sinner and you need Jesus. And if this morning, if you're willing to repent, lay down your life. Not try to be a better person. Jesus never died to make bad people good. He died to make dead people alive. I want to invite you this morning. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And once you've raised your hand, you're then going to come to the front. And as you come to the front, everyone's going to come to the front. But I'm asking you this morning, if you've never given your life to Jesus, and this morning's the time that you're going to accept that invitation, if you can raise your hand for me, please. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. That's fantastic. If your heart's racing and your lungs, 
You feel like they want to explode. It's the Holy Spirit working in you. And you might be a Christian. You might have prayed this prayer. But there's something that has to be ignited. Start saying yes to him right now. Start saying yes, Jesus. That's me. I'll do it. I'll run. I'll run. Ignite me. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. It's me. I'll do it. Perhaps you've been avoiding something. And this morning you're saying, yes, Jesus, I'll, I'll do that. I'll lay that down. I'll pick that up. Whatever you're calling me to do. Yes, Jesus, I'm going to stop being scared. I'm going to run and I'm going to pursue you. Yes, Jesus. The answer must always be yes, Jesus. And for too long you've ignored his call. You've ignored his voice. And this morning you're saying, yes, Jesus, I will no longer just be lukewarm. Something shifts this morning. My next season, there's a temperature shift. I'm just giving a moment for the Holy Spirit to work. Ask him what he needs to do. Ask him, ask him what he needs to do in your life. Ask him what's shifting. Perhaps you've taken a bit of a step backwards. Not busyness, passion. Perhaps there are things that you've been called into and you've been avoiding it. Perhaps there's leadership, perhaps there's stuff Perhaps there's some of you that for months you felt God has been saying, you called to more, go and speak to one of the pastors, and you've been avoiding it. I'm telling you, <laughs> my pastors are in front here. They come and chat to us after the meeting. And you go, but it's crazy. It, it, only lukewarm does the non-crazy thing. Lord, I pray for a refreshing and a warmth all at the same time to see people healed and restored and life and life in abundance. In Jesus' name. Can I ask you all to stand, please?